Did you know that the Dutch declared war on Japan before Britain and the US did? The Japanese completed their conquest of the Dutch East Indies in March 1942, and three and a half years of harsh rule followed, in which millions of Indonesians perished due to starvation and forced labor, as well as many Dutch who were put in concentration camps. What if I told you that all this could have been prevented by the Dutch government? To what extent was the Japanese attack provoked by the Dutch? Was there another way? Keep watching to find out. Good to have you back on the channel. If you are new, my name is Stefan, I'm a Dutch history teacher and I like to cover history for you. If you find it interesting, please consider subscribing, also hit that notification bell. If you want to support me, you can do so via Patreon, via PayPal or via a super thanks below the video. Japan was one of the few countries in East Asia that was not fully colonized by the Western powers. This is because major modernizations took place in the latter half of the 19th century. Due to the industrial developments, Japan realized the country was short on minerals. As a result, the country strived to conquer other countries to fill this shortage. In 1904 and 1905, Japan fought and won a war with Russia. The world was in shock. An Asian country that managed to beat a European country. In 1910, Japan annexed Korea. In the 1920s, Japan developed into a military dictatorship with militaristic officers in charge. In 1931, the Japanese army conquered the Chinese region of Manchuria and renamed it Manchukuo. In 1937, Japan invaded China and seized large tracts of land. In 1940-41, Japan seized control over French Indochina, present-day Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos. In 1941, Thailand became a force ally of Japan. The country could serve as a Japanese base for further attacks. And from December 1941, Japan launched the conquest of Southeast Asia. The Dutch East Indies was under Dutch rule for many years. Dutch merchants had arrived in the Indonesian archipelago centuries before. And by the early 20th century, the Dutch had completed their territorial conquest of what is now Indonesia. However they subdued threats militarily, a political challenge presented itself around that time, independence movements. Due to the ethical policy, a policy of ethical responsibility for the welfare of the Indonesian people, some Indonesians enjoyed education, and these persons set up political parties that tried for independence. When the Great Depression affected the colony in the 1930s, tensions rose. Political parties that strive for independence were banned and its leaders exiled. Then in May 1940, Germany conquered the Netherlands. From now on, the Dutch East Indies was a colony without a motherland. A state of siege was proclaimed, public meetings became forbidden, and potential dangerous persons were arrested. 2,800 Germans and 500 Dutch fascists were interned. Shortly after, Japan delivered a request, 1 million ton of petroleum per year, twice as much as the current export. And to this was a request for other minerals, such as bauxite and nickel ore. Japan amped up its demands in September 1940, asking 3 million tons a year. In December that year, a Japanese delegation arrived in the Dutch East Indies. Apart from demands for oil, they wanted Indonesia to become part of a greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, a concept that was propagated to Asian populations which were occupied by Japan from 1931 to 45 and which officially aimed at creating a self-sufficient bloc of Asian people and states that would be led by the Japanese. Dutch administrator Huib van Mook knew this was going to be a takeover and managed to postpone the negotiations for five more months. He delivered his final answer in June 1941. No. However, Tokyo was allowed to negotiate with private oil companies. Dutch Governor General Charta van Starkeborster Gauer feared the Japanese might declare war, but that didn't happen. The Dutch East Indies began preparing itself for war, but there were challenges. In the early and late 1920s, as well as the 1930s, austerity cuts were made. Now a reinforcement plan was introduced. This eight-point plan program provided for further reinforcement of the air arm, mechanization of infantry, increase of firepower for infantry and coastal artillery, and the filling of gaps in personnel. 
Contrary to the situation in the Netherlands from before May 1940, the Dutch could now freely talk with their allies to defend Southeast Asia against a possible Japanese attack. Big orders were placed with British and American weapon factories. Among the Dutch population in the East Indies, there was much support for volunteering. A local weapon factory, albeit small, was set up. Indonesian draft was introduced and by the end of 1941, the Dutch colonial army, the Royal Netherlands East Indies Army, the KNIL, counted for 76,000 men. Many held the Japanese army in low regard. Also, if the Japanese wanted to conquer the Dutch East Indies, they had to cover enormous distances. How were they able to do that? For almost half a century, Japan had been reliant on imported oil. This dependence was only increased after the Japanese had started their war of conquest in China. When in June 1941, the talks between the Dutch and the Japanese regarding oil deliveries deadlocked, the Japanese decided that this had to be taken by force. If this would also result in war with Britain and the US, well, that had to be taken for granted. A few weeks later, there was a meeting in Vichy, France. The fascist client state headed by Marshal Philippe Pétain. Japan wanted to station troops in the south of Indochina, current Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, a French colony that came under Vichy rule after the German conquest of France. From there, the Japanese would launch their conquest of Southeast Asia. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, in exchange, the French could keep control over their colony, albeit under Japanese military occupation. I'll go back to it later. When the Japanese entered the south of Indochina, the US reacted by freezing all of Japanese assets. Before that, the Americans had already announced a trade boycott for steel, scrap, and kerosene, as US President Roosevelt stated. There was a method of letting oil go to Japan with the hope, and it has worked for two years, of keeping war out of the Southern Pacific for our own good. With this, the bottom of the Japanese oil barrel came inside quick. The Netherlands joined the boycott and broke off trade agreements with Japan. The Dutch government in London apparently considered it more important to show its strongest side to the US and Great Britain than to make a realistic assessment of the danger of war. If the Netherlands had continued to fulfill its agreement with Japan, that country would certainly not have gone to war and history could have turned out very differently. But even at this point, war perhaps could have been averted. Because after the Japanese had launched their surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, it was not the US that declared war in Japan first, nor Great Britain, no. The Dutch were the first to declare war on Japan. Yes, the Dutch Governor General von Starkeborstagauer believed this was good for prestige. The Dutch government in London agreed. But what about this prestige when you cannot even defend your own territory? Even Japan was astonished. I read that when Dutch diplomat in Tokyo handed the Japanese the declaration of war, the Japanese gave him back the file. The Japanese were not at all in war with the Netherlands and they could have worked out an agreement as they had done with the French regarding Indochina. The British and American declarations of war followed shortly after. Japan only declared war to the Netherlands on the 11th of January 1942 when they invaded Borneo and Celebes. The Dutch, they felt emboldened by their allies. In the first two months of 1942, a joint allied force was set up. The ABDA command consisted of the Americans, British, Dutch and Australians. It was dissolved near the end of February. Hong Kong, the Philippines, Malaya and Singapore fell for the Japanese onslaught. In the meantime, the Japanese took over the many islands of the Dutch East Indies. There was fighting on Borneo, South Sumatra and Java. In March 1942, the Dutch colonial army surrendered. Some of its troops managed to get away to Australia, but most of them were captured and many would perish in Japanese captivity. As Van Rijbroek stated, history could have turned out very differently if the Dutch did not join the trade boycott against Japan. Now, normally I don't like to dwell on what if scenarios, but this here is a different thing because here we have an alternative that actually played out 
when we look at French Indochina. However, the French colony was under de facto Japanese rule. French citizens were left alone and were not put into internment camps. In March 1945, the Japanese seized full power of the colony because they feared, with France liberated, the French colonial forces would launch an uprising. Let's just say, if the Dutch would have allowed Japanese troops in the colony, most likely 20,000 Europeans would not have died in the Japanese internment camps in Indonesia. But the question is to what extent Indonesian suffering could have been avoided. Because the Japanese confiscated food, millions of Indonesians did perish during the Japanese occupation, but a likewise famine also occurred in Vietnam, in which up to 2 million Vietnamese the main causes of the Vietnamese famine were typhoons that reduced food availability, the Japanese occupation, American attacks on the Vietnamese transportation system, and the French colonial administration that hindered effective famine relief. Not to mention what Indonesian nationalists would have done. Because when the Japanese rolled in, they were greeted as liberated. But let's just say if the Japanese would have cooperated with the Dutch colonial authorities, perhaps Indonesian nationalists would have launched an uprising which then had to be put down with many casualties as a result. Thanks to my patrons, you see their names right now, and a special thanks to Thomas Zabiega, Damien Wallace, Connor, Philip Jordan, Marcus Kaas, Nick Terranova, Haley, Mark Little Hill, Janet Jojankiewicz, Joan, Justin Tabell, Tanya Dixie, Henry Clarkson, Rob Park, Andrea Martic, Susanna Di Bella, John Beach, Fabrizio, Way Back History, Fernando Lopez Ojeda, Luis Pichera, and Mike West. If you want to learn more about the process of how Indonesia became independent, you can click right here. I want to thank you for watching and see you later.